Hello, I'm Chris, and in the January-February 2023 issue of In Publishing, I wrote an article snapshotting the publishing sector when it comes to podcasting, so that as you look to start or evolve a podcasting strategy in 2023 and beyond, you'll be aware of what the major trends are in this space, and we'll make some good decisions to make shows that have a good long life and that work hard for you as well as for your readers. In the process of writing the article, I spoke to a bunch of interesting people in the sector. And as always with these things, there's thousands of words sitting on the cutting room floor that didn't make it into the finished piece. And so in this video, what I'm gonna do is go through just one section from that article, the sort of do's and don'ts from the very end, and share with you and reflect on and expand on some of the thoughts that the people I spoke to had about where we're at with podcasting in 2022, looking into 23. We're gonna start then with uh, Theodora Luludis, formerly of The Telegraph. And her first is to work with hosts who listen to a lot of podcasts. And it's a theme that will come up again and again, but it's a really important one. People who listen to podcasts have an innate understanding of the rhythms and uh, acceptable forms and the ways to make a show that works and resonates because it is a very different medium to the written word and so people who intuitively understand what that medium is and can do are important. Importantly here though there is a caveat which is to say that it's not true that you should slavishly copy every other podcast that's out there. There may be an approach that works for you but I still think Theo's point stands that you want to work with people who understand intuitively what a podcast format feels like. She also encourages us to think about what your USPs are. This is a really important point too, I completely agree with it. I think it extends beyond a kind of corporate view of what your USPs are as well. It's very easy in podcasting, I think, to think about replicating uh, a brand experience from the written word. Whether if you're a magazine, for example, you might think about doing a podcast that is a sort of reification of that magazine in audio form with an introduction, with some news, with some features, with a buyer's guide, something like that. But I think that you should think really about what the soul of that brand is and ways in which that can connect with people in ways that feel appropriate for that medium. Her next is to set up an email address to gather listener feedback. I think the broad point here is completely correct. I, you can argue about the correct way of doing that, whether that's through social, whether that's through uh, uh, reader, uh, listener, reader, listener surveys, ways of quantifying the ways in which your show is resonating are really important. An email address is certainly one of the easiest ways to do it. My one warning here is to make sure that whatever you set up, you also set up processes to look at that uh, information that comes in over that email channel and action it. And I mean not just who's going to check the inbox, but also what do you do with that information? How do you process it? What do you think is important? As you don't want to just be guided, buffeted by the winds of what your listeners are saying, but you want to sort of consider it. So whether that's a quarterly review, um, a more ongoing organic thing, whatever it happens to be, think about how you're going to process it. Her third point is a really interesting one. It's one that I hadn't crystallised in my head, so I'm really grateful she put it down, which is to think about what the draw is to your show. And if it's a show that has a strong personality, then lead on imagery of that personality. Or if it's a show that is more topic-based or subject-based, then lead on imagery for the album artwork and elsewhere that uh, talks to that strength as well. The one thing I'll say here is, uh, I am always of the opinion that people will come to a podcast especially for the topic, but they'll stay for the people. And so you actually might see that strategy evolve over time. It might be that you start a podcast about cycling and it just has pictures of bikes on it, but two years later, the audience has really got, was warmed to the hosts and that way you start putting the hosts on your publicity material for that podcast instead. And that's valuable because one of the things that podcasting can do is it can really elevate the profile of your journalist. It can really elevate the profile of the people in a title, which helps enormously in lots of ways. It humanizes them, it makes sure people can understand who they are, and when they encounter their byline, they will have a better understanding of their strengths and, I guess, their weaknesses as well, but they will have a more authentic relationship with that people. Theo's last point, and something that will be brought up later on, is not to take podcast charts too seriously. It doesn't equate who has most listens. It specifically doesn't, for Apple in particular. If you look at the Apple podcast algorithm, 
they eventually uh, admitted, is maybe the wrong word, but they eventually stated what had been inferred before, which is it's a, it's a black box. We don't know exactly what happens in that algorithm for those, those rankings, but we know that, for example, it can be a mix of uh, um, listener acquisitions and so new subscribers, completion rates, and uh, other factors as well. So it's not who's got the most listeners, it's certainly who's bubbling a little bit most, who is creating more noise in that space, perhaps, and usually positive noise, but it is not a ranking of a show's size. One thing I wanted to add to this is that there is a flip to this, which is that it is possible to game the charts a little bit. I don't mean in any nefarious ways, but I've worked on shows, for example, that went to the number one spot in their category on their launch day because they were acquiring new subscribers quickly, which made the algorithm take notice. And that was useful because we got then to do an extra round of promo saying that it was number one, but also it means that it was uh, instrumental in bringing over some commercial activity. So I guess I agree with Theo's point, don't take the chart seriously and certainly don't view them as a list of show size, but be ready to take advantage of a position you have because it sounds good and it can be something that is reasonably achievable. Next, I spoke to Chris Stone from The New Statesman. Chris's first point was, don't record in an echoey meeting room and to record something with soft furnishings. Absolutely, uh, thin echoey sound can be quite off-putting, be quite hard to listen to. Listeners will put up with some quite challenging audio conditions and if your content is good enough, but why make them? <laughs> why make them put up with ropey conditions? And a reverb from uh, echoey meeting rooms is certainly one of those. Now, there are some things you can do to mitigate even in a meeting room. You could record, for example, with a short throw dynamic microphone with a cardioid pickup pattern. These words might mean nothing to you, but talk to some experts, another one of the points coming up, and you'll understand that if you're working with a, a dynamic mic that's got a short throw cardioid pickup pattern, it will reduce the amount of reverb being picked up from the meeting room. But if you can do some uh, softening of that space, or indeed, especially if you're recording from home, a bedroom's usually great, there's lots of soft furnishings, definitely not a kitchen, not a bathroom, don't know why I'd be recording in a bathroom, but find a space that has got soft furnishings, and that goes too for any guests that you'll have involved in the show as well. Give your journalists time to prepare. It's likely that a good proportion of the journalists on your team will be excited about doing a podcast, but will be nervous as well. And it is a very different skill set producing audio content than it is producing written content. You're speaking much more extemporaneously. You're almost always showing a bit more of yourself than you would in carefully considered copy, unless you're a polemicist. Um, but they, they will need some time to prepare and they will also need support. A lot of support and encouragement and reassurance and enfranchisement to make sure that when they do sit in front of the microphone, they're not expected to give pristine copy from the get-go, they can um and ah, um, we can iterate, we can improve as we go. So his next point, don't expect to turn up and speak, is really well taken. They will need to practice, they will need to, uh, and you as the brand holder will need to make your peace with some slight roughness. Never put out anything you're embarrassed by, of course, but think about what actually is an acceptable level of quality for you. And remember that especially if you yourself listen to podcasts, think about the shows that you're with, there will usually be a little bit of polish at the start, maybe in the middle, maybe at the end, as the ads and section breaks come in, but usually the conversation, like now, that's running is a little more free form. His next point is actually one of the most important ones in the whole snapshot of podcasting in 2022, looking into 23, and that's thinking about how that podcast strategy evolves within the newsrooms. Um, that can mean basically strategic things, so thinking about how you are exposing that podcast to people, how you're replicating that content in other ways, but it can be very nitty gritty things as well. We tend, I think, to think in silos, which is Chris's next point in, uh, in publishing an awful lot, and we should be trying to break those down as much as possible to get, for example, marketing working as closely with editorial and with commercial and everything else as possible. It's definitely the case that people should be playing to their strengths, but it shouldn't be the case that somebody writes a briefing document and then six people go off in the different departments and make the things they need to happen happen. 
So here's a tiny little concrete example. Um, if, for example, you have a, an interview-based podcast, writing up that interview, not I don't mean as a transcript, although that's a separate thing you can do as well, but writing up the interview and pulling out, as you would a story, as you would an, in, an interview that hadn't had an audio component, and using that as a way of uh, bringing people to the podcast as well is good because A, it's more content, it's meaning your content is working harder, but also it means that your content is marketing itself. You're not having to create a, a, a separate marketing assets to bring people to the show. The very show itself is bringing people in. Which is Chris's last point, and actually marketing is one of the things that I bang on about in the article. We should be spending much more time marketing our shows than we are. You could argue that you should spend at least as much time marketing the content as you do making the content. We tend not to think that way often in publishing, but it's important that we do. The good thing with a podcast is a, a podcasting tends to be slightly less direct action related. So it's not usually um, about uh, bringing people to listen to a particular episode or to or clipping out bits to tease people in, as we see with great success with things like LBC. Those things are good and useful and should definitely be at least considered as part of your marketing strategy. But I think with podcasting, you can also rely on a much more ambient kind of advertising that is just saying over and over again, did you know we have a podcast? Have you listened to our podcast? By the way, there's a podcast. Why don't you go and listen to our podcast? And that might be things like uh, house ads, you know, changing page furniture. It might be uh, ambient uh, post rolls, pre rolls, dynamic ads on other bits of media that you have. It might be some uh, on-site activity. Though, there, but but I think it's worth thinking at least as much about that kind of ambient view of telling people about the podcast is is about this person said this. Come and listen to it. Right, next up, a couple of people from uh, Media Voices. Esther first talking about getting people to sit around a table and work out what makes sense to build, but also to reuse. I come back to an earlier point. I think you'll be doing a listenership a disservice if you only think in terms of replicating an uh, experience that exists in print or online. Audio is a different thing. It is much more immersive. It is much less frantic. People consume it in a very different way. Usually they're doing something else like walking the dog or uh, doing the dishes or commuting. And they want different things from it. It's more experiential rather than information sharing. Usually, not always, but usually. And so when you're thinking about repurposing, it may be that you go through a process of analyzing what you have and thinking about repurposing it and you come up with the answer, there is nothing here to repurpose. And that is fair. Unlikely, but fair. Um, but it's also true that, as I said, it, when I was talking about Chris's uh, do's and don'ts, it may be that in the very act of reusing content from print and online into audio or vice versa, that you are making that content work harder. There's this really strong argument, for example, that if you as a journalist or your journalist do a bunch of uh, interviews as part of your news gathering or feature writing or whatever it is you do, if you do those interviews, why not conduct them through a virtual studio platform like Riverside or Zencast or Squadcast in order that you have that content recorded and could turn it into, rather than using a phone, right? Use a proper studio platform so that you could turn it into content that could be used in an audio show. So yeah, think about that reuse, but don't be slavish about that reuse would be my uh, tip. Next up, a few tips from Peter. Don't put your first episode out. I am a huge advocate of doing pilots, at least pilot, but pilots internally. It will work out some of the nerves, some of the giggles, but it'll also work out some of the kinks and you'll be able to work out, is this format working? Do I need to iterate it? So my advice is to create a pilot, the full, full thing. I mean, you might not have the kit, that's fine. Don't invest if you're not sure. Um, you might be using uh, uh, watermarked audio for music or whatever it is, but, but try and do, this is what an episode would sound like. And never make your first episode, make your 50th episode, because the first episode is always, uh, or very often, has a welcome to our brand new podcast, hope you enjoy it kind of vibe to it. But think about what does your 50th episode, what does your 207th episode sound like? Just make a normal episode, but do the whole thing 
with the music and the ads and the uh, calls to action, the whole thing, and then listen to it yourself and other key stakeholders in the organization listen to it in a way that people listen to podcasts. So don't sit at your desk and uh, press play on an audio file on your laptop. Get on your phone, go for a walk, wash your dishes, listen to it when you're on your drive home, the way people would listen to podcasts. And what you're trying to do here is not even so much think about the specifics of we need to adjust the CTA there, um, that intro is a bit clumsy. You're thinking about the overall feel, the sort of defocused, blur your eyesight view of what that podcast looks like. Um, and by doing that, you get to iterate. Now, I've actually had the experience in one of the shows I worked on before where we did actually put one of the pilots out because there was some really good stuff happened in it. But we pushed that. It wasn't a time-sensitive news-based show, but we pushed that into episode five or six of the first season and put it out with a introduction that talked about the fact that this was never intended to be released and so the audio quality is a bit ropey but trust us there's a good reason we have decided to inflict it on your ears just now. So that might have come but Peter's point is a really well made one, don't put your first episode out. Make sure you are doing a, a little bit of practice for your ears only. Edit. Edit, edit, edit. This is not about taking out every um and pause necessarily, although depending on the style of show you do, you may wish to invest that time in doing that. It's about uh, cutting out fluff and getting to the point. It's exactly the same mindset as you'd use if you're editing copy. Um, thinking about what you need to say and what you need to not say in order to get to the good stuff. Um, there might be some operational edits that need to be done as part of that. It might be that you, if you're recording, for example, remotely, there's a time delay. So in as I'm when I'm producing and editing, I'll quite often spend quite a lot of time tightening those conversations up so they flow better, cutting out crosstalk, that kind of thing. I can't remember now who said it. It might have been Roman Mars, uh, uh, a well-known podcaster in the US. But somebody at least said, if if you have a thousand listeners and you take out a minute of waffle. You haven't taken out a minute of waffle, you've taken out a thousand minutes of waffle because the more work you do on behalf of your listeners and the bigger your audience base is, then the more time you're saving them. Um, and that's not in a, that sounds a little bit time and motion study, doesn't it? But it's really about treating your audience with respect and working out how much of their time you feel comfortable asking for. Peter's next point is an interesting one about monetization. I think it's right that you should be thinking about the longevity and sustainability of a show, um, all the while giving yourself the, the flexibility of saying, nope, it's not working, shut it all down. But you should be giving it a good chance. Where I diverge from Peter's view is, I don't think it's just about monetization. I think podcasts can have different missions. Some of them might be direct revenue generating. Some of them might be about audience acquisition though. Especially if you're an older heritage brand, you might want to use podcasting, which tends to skew a bit younger, as a way of bringing new audiences in to your brand. It might be about strengthening relationships with external stakeholders or internal stakeholders. It might be about a mix of things. So I think, uh, all of which is not to say that you shouldn't be thinking about monetizing in the first place, but monetization can be a tricky thing with podcasting at levels that people will traditionally be comfortable with in publishing. The audience numbers tend to be very small and that means it's a little harder for commercial teams to think about how those uh, sponsorships or goodness, even direct insertion of ads would work and how much gener uh, revenue they would generate. But, I think the bigger point here is think about the sustainability of your show. How do you make sure your show isn't going to wither and fail for lack of sustainable strategy behind it? And again, the point about listening to other publisher podcasts. I think there's an important point here as well. You should be listening, of course, to any direct competitors you have or any sort of analogous, sideways kind of competitors you have. But it's also worth listening to podcasts from publishers or indeed not from publishers, um, in a completely different space to the one that you operate in. Because then very often, it's a bit like when you set text in Lorem Ipsum, right? You're not 
the, the reason designers do that is so you don't get focused on the words and instead you focus on the shape of the page and the layout. And that's really true for podcasting as well. If you listen to shows that have come out from other publishers who are not in your space, if you're an angling magazine, for example, and you listen to some podcasts from a car magazine, then you'll be listening to the structure and format and form of the show and often there will be very replicable things in there. It might be quite intangible things like they are very informal, they swear, um, should we be doing that? Or it might be very tang tangible, actionable things like my God, that call to action was brilliant. They're, I can see that they're immediately going to attract some engagement through whatever mechanism they're using. Let's do the same thing ourselves. So listen to other, other podcasts is a, is a key one as well. Next, we've got uh, two, um, it's a little bit wall, wall of text getting, isn't it? But And so in this case, I've split Adam onto two slides. This is Adam, the editor of the new uh, podcasting site, PodPod. Don't treat podcasting as a side project. And um, I think there's an argument that as there will be people in your organization who are passionate about something like this and it's definitely worth um, allowing that passion to flourish which might not be as part of a day-to-day a, a -day responsibilities but if you're at all serious about this um, podcasting can be a, a very it can be a very light resource thing if you are dabbling or if you formatted and, and conceived of a show in such a way that it can be quite deliverable. But the more seriously you take it and the more you want it to do well and to succeed, then certainly the more time it will bring up. And so it might be challenging for somebody to do that as part of their day job, to do it as a side project. And then the day job suffers as well. So I think a more serious approach to resourcing is important. And it might be, it's the same decisions you'd have around any new brand extension. If you're not going to invest more in staff, then how do you square that circle? Is it freeing up some freelance budget to take some duties off somebody? Is it deciding to shut down another part of the brand uh, reification in order that time can be spent on podcasting etc. Investing is a theme of Adam's next tip which is investing in proper equipment. Uh, the good thing is this can be a very small investment. Uh, microphones can cost, decent microphones can be about 60-70 pounds each. Um, it, you can obviously spend much 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 more and when you start doing things like what Chris Stone is doing at the New Statesman about building studios and creating proper space, or acoustically treated spaces to record in, things start to get logistically quite heavy. But it is definitely true that the investment required in terms of hardware is very small and so you should make it. Try to avoid um, using laptop mics, using phones. These are all doable. They're not uh, wrong or evil but the investment is so small, there's not really a good reason not to make it. Charts again is on Adam's next slide, uh, which is a funny comment to come after my initial comment saying, you might on your first day, just bump straight to the top of the charts, but he's saying don't expect chart success to come immediately. I think the more important point here, the sort of bigger meta point that Adam's making is a really important one, which is that podcasting can be a very organic but slow growth medium. The challenge I have with saying that is that people go, well, let's not bother then. But the numbers that I've seen in my career in podcasting always go up. It's a slow growth, but it is an inexorable growth. And it's really nice looking at a dashboard in publishing when all the lines go up. So audiences, at least just now, are still happily accreting to podcasts. The other important point there though is, even though the audience might be comparatively small, it is intensely loyal and very engaged. And if you think about the amount of time that an audience, uh, uh, somebody might spend engaging with your content online versus, how, versus the hours that they're spending um, engaging with your content through podcasting, you can see that this is a hardcore, super fan, friend audience. It's not just a, a transactional thing where they're coming to you for information. They are your hardest core, most valuable audience. And so 
that is good because if you want to talk to your audience directly, let's say you've got a podcast and then you, you know, next year, Q4, you're going to do an event. You can talk to that audience directly to get them. To, they're the ones that are going to be most likely to come to that event. But it also means that they are loyal and they'll make time for you. And in an attention uh, deficit economy, that's a really important thing. Adam last point comes back to his point about investing in equipment, which is, and this reflects again what a couple of other people have said, this part of the professionalization of podcasting for publishers is key, but investing in skills so that you know, even if it's something as simple as bring somebody in for a consultant for an hour so that you are asking, if I'm going to spend £500 on microphones and recording equipment, what £500 should I be spending? Where should I be spending that £500? If you can do that, then you're not going to make um, a mistake and have to live with it for uh, some months or years before finally correcting it. But it also might be about bringing in expertise to do production work, to do uh, you know, a producer, an, an executive producer, uh, an editor, or even people working on the content uh, format idea, the sort of creative strategy behind a piece. There's lots of skills out there, and it's a, a really good point, well made, that bringing, pe- bringing those skills in, buying those skills in, will jump you ahead in your podcasting journey. There's absolutely nothing wrong, I've done it myself, with learning as you go with evolving your uh, understanding and your abilities. But if you want to not do that, or if you're working at a level or with clients who demand a level that is much more polished, then you can just buy those skills in. Three from Sarah at Bababam. These are key things, I think, to think about in that broader strategy, the 30,000 foot view of podcasting. Working on your core strengths, focusing on what works for you. I think these are key because we've talked about um, how it might not be appropriate to uh, blindly replicate what you do in a print or online space in audio. And yet the flip is also true that the things that work for you in those spaces may well work for you well. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about format and ways in which that content is expressed but it might just be that you realize if you're do if you're a sport title for example you know that transfer season is a re- for football is a really big deal for your uh, audience and so perhaps you go heavy on transfer season in audio but you have to work out exactly what that feels like and how best to translate that into an audio space this next point is so crucial it's in the article and in publishing, you need to make podcasting a first-class citizen within your newsroom or your magazine editorial team. Too often it is a, a siloed little project for two people sitting over in the corner and it never gets the love and so it never gets this, the chance of success that it deserves. And so the things you would do with good content for the written word should be done for good content for the spoken word as well. And that also applies in Sarah's last point to SEO. Uh, You should be doing really good work with your titles and descriptions for your episodes, landing pages if you have them. But if a small proportion of your traffic to your uh, web property is coming from uh, organic search, then perhaps that's not somewhere you want to spend a huge amount of your time. Do your basic hygiene, but perhaps you don't want to focus too much on it. But if you're a site that is driven by (laughs) organic search, then for God's sake, make sure you're doing the same for podcasting as well. Last set of tips comes from Nikki Simpson, the International Magazine Centre. I thought I'd go with a a very text light slide to end on since you've endured some quite heavy ones uh, up to now. Nikki encourages you to publish transcripts of your shows and there's some good reasons for doing that. One is accessibility, to make sure that people who have hearing difficulties can still consume your content. Um, But also... People will people may consume content in different ways at different parts of their day or their life or their week, whatever it happens to be. So it might be that somebody uh, is happy to uh, listen to a podcast when they're 
doing the shopping. But it might be that they get stuck with a sleeping baby in their arms and don't have a way of listening to a podcast, but they can still scroll through, thumb through a transcript on their phone. And so thinking about how appropriate it is to, to uh, create transcripts of your show, when you're thinking about that, you have to think about not just about accessibility, but about different usage patterns for your uh, content. The other advantage, of course, is that transcripts will generally be very, very long. Uh, and that's an advantage. I call that an advantage because uh, that means there's some very weighty pieces going up online. Now, we're kind of past the days where Google was looking at things like that uh, in bold terms and equating article length with expertise, but it can still play a part in the SEO understanding of uh, a site. The big downside to this, though, is that transcripts can take a huge amount of resource to create. Yes, there are uh, automated transcription service like, uh, services like Otter. Even Word Online can transcribe and do a decent job of it. Um, but unless you're dealing with some fairly mainstream accents, it's likely to be a little bit rough in places. And even those times where you're dealing with accents that the AIs are well trained on, you still need, I would submit, to go through that transcript and tidy things up because it will not be perfect. And in a very worst case scenario, you could be laying yourself open to libel or something, some sort of defamation suit if somebody has been transcribed inaccurately. And that's a big investment in somebody's time or money to make sure that that's right. Uh, second to last com comment from Nikki is milk it. I think her point is well taken that uh, if somebody has signed up to your newsletter or if they're following you on social or if they have somehow said, yes, please, I like what you're doing, please give it to me. I think we're sometimes very reticent in, in this industry. We're very aware of uh, blasting information at people. And that's a good thing. We shouldn't just be a, a complete fire hose um, drowning our audiences. But so often we either don't tell people at all that a new episode is out, just assume people will find it in the in the feed or through SEO, or we tell them once. And I think working out different ways of uh, having the same message, which is come and listen to this podcast, is really good. And I think the saving grace and the reason it's important that Nikki's point is is, is so well made is that if somebody said expressed somehow that they want to hear from you, let them hear from you and don't feel bad about them hearing from you. We're going to finish then with a thread that's run through throughout this entire video and indeed is in the article and in publishing the Jan Feb 2023 issue, listen to podcasts. Uh, podcasts are not radio, podcasts are not written copy, they are their own thing. There are infinitely many ways of creating podcasts but you will only understand the rhythms and tropes and um, the things that make it special if you yourself listen to them. So, you've listened to me for long enough. Go off and listen to some podcasts and then in 2023 and beyond, go and make some phenomenal podcasts. Thanks for watching.